Welcome to part 2 of my 7 part series, Robert's Guide to Buying an Electric Bike. Today we'll cover the different kinds of motors. Why motors can be either in the middle of the back wheel, or between the pedals, or in the front wheel. We'll talk about the pros and cons of the three different motor positions. We'll see what is the maximum power an electric bicycle is allowed to have in different jurisdictions and factors that can influence your choice of an e-bike. We're starting right after this. Because electric bike motors are so different from automobile motors, this is a very important subject to understand. Basically, there are either mid-drive motors located in the crankset between the pedals or hub motors located in the middle of the wheels. Before asking which is better, it's important to understand how each works. Let's start with mid-drive motors. Mid-drive e-bikes always have gears on the rear wheel called sprockets, which provide from 7 to 11 gears depending on the manufacturer's design. The big advantage of having the motor in the crankset is that it allows the rider to choose the right gear ratio based on the speed and the riding conditions, such as road incline and wind direction. This allows the motor to apply just the right amount of torque without the risk of overheating and wasting energy. For example, for the same amount of power, a mid-drive system can allow the bike to climb steeper grades and tow heavier loads than with a hub motor. Because it benefits from the bicycle's gearing system, it operates close to the optimal speed of the motor, so it lasts longer than a geared hub motor. Another advantage of having the motor in the middle of the bike, closer to the bike's center of gravity, is to provide a better weight distribution, which makes the bike slightly more stable on the road. The disadvantages. First, they're more expensive than hub motors because they're a little more complicated. They're usually enclosed in a casing, and they incorporate the controller and the sprocket. Another disadvantage that you may not think about until you actually ride one is that you have to remember to gear down every time you come to a stop in order to make it easier to get the bike moving again when you start up. When you ride in the city, you have to remember to switch to a lower gear at every corner where you have to come to a stop. So if you don't enjoy changing gears, a mid-drive e-bike isn't for you. Another disadvantage is that if something goes wrong in the drivetrain, like a broken chain, or a broken derailleur, or a broken pedal, or if the chain jumps off the chain ring, and you can't remove the chain guard in order to put the chain back in place, that's the end of your ride. You have to walk home and you can't use the bike until you can get it repaired. Now that we've seen the mid-drive motor, let's look at motors that are located in the middle of the wheels, hub motors. Hub motors are simpler and less expensive than mid-drives. They work independently from the rider's choice of gears. They can get the bike moving from a dead stop regardless of which gear the cyclist has chosen. They also accelerate faster than mid-drive bikes because, since it's not necessary to change gears, there's less time lost between gear changes. Unlike a bike with a mid-drive motor, if a component of the drivetrain breaks and you can no longer pedal, and if the bike has a throttle, the hub drive system allows you to continue to ride with just the motor. The bike will take you back home and getting it repaired won't be an emergency. You could ride it that way all year. If we decide on a hub drive, should it be a front wheel drive or a rear wheel drive? The decision will be easy if your bicycle store sells only rear wheel hub drives, which is usually the case because they're more popular than the front wheel version. But there are good reasons why a person might prefer front wheel drive for their e-bike. 
The front wheel hub drive is better on ice, snow, and loose sand because it pulls the bike in the direction of the steering. Also, having the motor up front makes it easier to remove the wheel to fix the flat, and it leaves the rear wheel hub free in case you want to convert your bike to a single speed bike, or you would like an internally geared hub, which I'll talk about in part four of this series. One small disadvantage is that in some instances, because there's less weight on the front wheel, can easily spin out if you apply too much power. Maybe it wouldn't be practical for towing a heavy trailer in hilly terrain. Rear wheel hub motors are more popular perhaps because they give marginally better traction than front wheel ones, but there's no real advantage in having it at the rear rather than at the front. All wheel drive e-bikes have a motor in each wheel. Usually the motors can be switched on individually. This would be a good option for those who want to bend the rules and disable the lock speed adjustment, but I think they would provide thrilling performance in very steep hills. They would also be excellent for towing a heavy trailer or a bicycle camper. If you opt for a hub motor, should it be a geared motor or a direct drive motor? Let me explain. The direct drive motor is a very simple one. It is composed of two main parts. The stator, which is fixed in place in the fork, and the rotor, which is connected to the wheel by the spokes and makes the wheel turn. For each revolution of this rotor, the wheel makes one complete turn. The obvious characteristic is their size. They are bigger and heavier than the geared motor that I'm going to talk about next so it will be heavier to lift onto a bicycle rack or to take it up a flight of stairs. It has somewhat less zip and go than the geared motor when accelerating, but it will reach a higher top speed if the speed limiter is inactivated. It also has the following disadvantage. When coasting with the direct drive, that is, when not pedaling or when pedaling with the motor turned off, the electromagnetic field causes some resistance, which slows down the bike and makes it harder to pedal. I often hear the question, is it possible to charge a battery by pedaling? The answer is a conditional yes. Yes, you can, but only when riding downhill. Unlike a geared motor, a direct drive motor can regenerate electricity into the battery when you're going downhill or when you apply the brakes. When going down a hill, you can add a little more power into the battery by pedaling fast. You might be able to prop the bike up on a stand and recharge the battery by pedaling, but it would be very inefficient way to produce electricity. I think you would then realize that your hydro bill is really very inexpensive. Regeneration doesn't produce much more range, but it's free energy. But its most important advantage is not what you think. Because it's possible to come to a full stop with the motor alone, it results in a great reduction in the wear of your brake pads. Another advantage is that a direct drive motor is very quiet. Owners of direct drive e-bikes are surprised when they hear the noise that a geared motor makes. Even the owners of geared motors themselves sometimes find the noise annoying when they're riding on a quiet trail. The geared motor is smaller and lighter than its direct drive counterpart, and since it turns faster than the direct drive motor, and because it's geared down, it has more torque at startup than the direct drive motor. Typically, the gears have a 5 to 1 ratio. That is, for every five revolutions of the motor, the wheel makes one full turn. A geared motor is much more complex, as you can see from this picture, and it doesn't cause any resistance when you're coasting, because a clutch disconnects the motor when the power is cut. It has a shorter lifespan than its direct drive counterpart. It's more susceptible to breakage because the gears, believe it or not, are made of plastic and can melt if exposed to excessive heat. Before going on to the next subject, I'll just mention that mid-drive e-bikes are unique in that on account of the space constraints, their motor is always of a geared type. While on the subject of motors, let's talk about power. 
Cars have been around for so long that anybody who hasn't been living under a rock has heard the word horsepower and that it refers to how powerful is a gasoline engine. Buddy bike motor power is traditionally measured in watts. For safety reasons, all jurisdictions have set a limit on the maximum power of an electric bike motor in order for it to be allowed on roads and shared trails. As I mentioned in part one of this series, Europe is the most conservative, having set their limit to 250 watts. In the United States, the limit has been set to 750 watts, and in Canada, the country of compromise, the limit has been set to 500 watts. In North America, you can also find smaller motors as well, either 250 or 350 watts. I had a Cube with a 350 watt Bosch motor and a Pedigo with a 500 watt motor, and all I can say is that the higher wattage motor felt considerably more powerful than the lower wattage one. A lot of people, including myself, are confused about continuous or peak motor power. A motor can be rated at 500 watts continuous, but can develop a peak of 1000 watts or more. This is a field that I'm not knowledgeable about, so if you'd like to know more about this subject, you might want to read the article on this subject by Grin Technologies, linked in the description. There is one more point before ending this session. The burning question is, how much power should my e-bike have? This would depend on your riding ability, your riding style, and the use you make of your e-bike. If you're a skilled rider, you won't feel intimidated even by the most powerful of e-bikes on the market, and you might prefer the peppiest e-bikes. If you're an occasional rider who rarely rides more than 10 or 20 kilometers in a day, 250 or 350 watts would be adequate. If you live in a hilly area or if you're towing a trailer, you'll need the most powerful bike you can find. Join me in part 3, which will cover the basics of e-bike batteries. We'll be talking about battery power, best position on the bike, capacity, weight, charging, longevity, range, theft precautions, cost, and safety. Thank you for watching, and remember, never quit cycling!